that okay? Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, so I have no idea what he said. I knew at one point there you were kind of doing the official bio, and then you switched over to your own personal comments. So um, we, we had a bit, uh, a bit of aguardiente last night, so I think I'll just sit down for the, for the presentation. Um, the slide? Enrique, you need help? I don't know. Always technical difficulties. Uh, so I understand this is not actually a hotel. It's a, it's a club. Uh, yeah, so, so, I mean, with Execution Labs, it's kind of a, an interesting experiment where uh, we tricked a bunch of uh, VCs to give us money so that we can turn around and give it to uh, indie developers. Uh, and it's been a really interesting experiment where we're trying to kind of balance the um, uh, development side of, you know, being creative and wanting to innovate and building something fun, but at the same time, building something that can actually make money and be commercially viable. Uh, and you know, how do you balance creativity and entrepreneurship or, or fun and, and business? Uh, and sort of one of the um, uh, experiments that we're doing with Execution Labs. Uh, and, and so building this bridge with the venture world, with, with investment, with funding, uh, has been something that we've kind of thrown ourselves into. Because for the most part, game developers don't really understand the funding part. They don't really understand how you know, uh, uh, venture capitalists work, where the money comes from. And I mean, it's amazing how many conversations I've had where a developer says, oh, well, you know, now we're working on a prototype, and then we'll just go get the money. You know, some imaginary place where the money exists, where they can just go and, and, and get it, uh, without really understanding you know, who has money and you know, what kind of money you can go get, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, I, we've been, I've been doing presentations uh, more recently on, on funding and sort of understanding uh, a bit the, uh, the money landscape uh, as a way to educate uh, developers. So this presentation, I won't really be talking about Execution Labs per se and what we're doing there. Um, it's a very sort of specific model, specific program. Um, and so I think we'll just go without the, the visuals. Um, yet, uh, so, so the first bit of advice in terms of fundraising or getting money or getting funding is the best time to take money or someone else's money is never. That ideally, you don't need to take someone's money. You don't need funding. You can either do it on your own with your own savings uh, or um, uh, you, know, you bootstrap, you just kind of build stuff and, and you don't sort of ever stop to take someone else's money. You know, not that it's necessarily a bad thing, but uh, but you're always better off not owing someone else uh, the funding. Uh, the second best time to take external funding is when you don't need it. So that's the kind of other, other irony is that um, you're not, if you don't actually need the money, then, oh, here we go. No, that's the wrong one. Which, uh, why, do you have the, uh, the USB? Hold on a second, one sec. All right, so yeah, so, so best time is never. Second best time is when you don't need it. Uh, the, the reality is that when you do need it, that's when you're most likely to sort of uh, be dumb about it or be stupid or sort of desperate, uh, and you'll accept sort of not ideal terms. Uh, and so, you know, so, so it's a tough, it's a tough uh, situation. All right, let's see if we... Uh, not that it's... Uh, so whenever you're, you're, you're presenting to investors, make sure your PowerPoint works. <laughs> That's uh, tip, uh, tip number one. Um, uh, one uh, the, the one without the X's. N no X's, no X's. X's mean bad. <laughs> we'll see if it... Uh, this is going to be a miracle if it works. All right, there we go. Okay, but not presenter mode. So I, I'm actually curious. So, so I'm assuming most people in the room are actual game developers, game development. Yes, show of hands. So mostly, mostly everyone. Are there any actual investor, sort of VC, banker, money? No, they're <laughs> they're they're still they're still sleeping. Uh, how many people have actually uh, taken external funding, whether it's government or or uh, an incubator or VC? Anyone? I know a couple. Wow. Okay. So so a few folks have taken from their mom. From the rich, 
rich, rich uncle. That 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 counts. Uh, that counts as. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, yeah, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so, so one of the things to understand is not everybody or every type of company or every product is investable. So, so I normally uh, think about um, sort of the uh, um, you know indie world, the independent game development across, or, or I define it across two axes. One is the degree to which you have creative freedom, and then the degree to which you have legal freedom. And you can kind of think about what you do as a business or the types of companies that exist or studios that exist in the game industry and where they might fit along those two axes. Uh, and so indie developers have both of those things, right? They're creatively uh, independent, meaning you know we're indie, so we get to do what we want and we make up our own ideas, we generate original IP, and we're also legally independent in that nobody owns us. We, we own ourselves, we're you know, our own little company, or, or not even a company, it's just, you know, you, you and I in, in the garage doing, doing our own thing, and so no one sort of owns or controls us. So that's kind of you know, fully creative independence and legal independence. On, on the sort of flip side, you have companies that might be legally independent, but are not creatively independent. So think of a studio that does mainly work for hire, or an outsourced studio. So that kind of studio, they exist as their own company, but they don't have creative independence because they're doing work on someone else's IP, they're doing work on someone else's brand, uh, they're building art assets for someone else's game, so they don't have that creative independence. On the flip side, or on the opposite end, and this will all be more evident if we have the visuals to help you, so I'll just watch my hands, but um, on the other side you have uh, internal studios, right? So internal studios at big publishers are not legally independent because they're within a large sort of public company. And generally speaking, they don't have creative independence because they're just told to make Call of Duty 17 uh, and don't really, you know, it's like, fine, within that they may have some leeway to be creative, you know, to add some new gameplay mechanic, but essentially they're creating something known, the next version, next iteration uh, thereof. So uh, it's, it, you know, they, they lack creative independence. So they're the kind of complete opposite of indie. They're not legally independent and they're not creatively uh, independent. Uh, then you have uh, sort of a special category which is uh, sort of they're uh, not legally independent so they're within the large publishers but they do have some degree of creative independence. This is what I would call sort of skunk works or kind of R&D labs where you have a, a couple of developers that are off in the corner hiding somewhere from everyone else and they're told to experiment or explore whether it's some new technology or new platform or new business model and so they do have some creative independence yeah, okay, this is, this is it. All right, good. But can we get out of the, uh, that's, that's the best we can do? <laughs> All right. All right, well, okay, so we'll just, that's better than my, my hand, hand waving. Is there a, can I, do you have a clicker or something? Or, or Kike, are you going to be my clicker? Well, now you lost it. <laughs> I'll come here. Okay, I'll switch to the sofa. All right, so now you can get a preview of what's coming next. Um, all right, so, so here we go. So, so uh, two axes, creative freedom, legal freedom. Indies in the top right being both creative and legally independent. Uh, bottom is the outsourcer work for hire where they're, free, they're, whatever, they're legally independent but not creatively, internal studios, and then skunk work. So the only one or only quadrant out of that that's actually investable is the indies quadrant. Right, because that's the one that has the potential to create true value, to create breakout hits, new IP, uh, no one is going to provide external funding, uh, sort of a, from a professional investment point of view, to an outsourced studio because that's not a scalable business. You know, as an outsourcer work for a hire shop, you're generally lucky if you get 10% on every 10% margin or 10% profit, and that's just not big enough of an opportunity for uh, for investors. Uh, and then the 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 opposite end of the legal freedom doesn't, you know, you're not investable because you're part of Activision or you know whatever EA. You're a huge public uh, public company. All right, so, um, yeah, try not to look at the, the small one, but anyways, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so who knows who this is? Indie Game the Movie. Well, it's, yeah, Phil Fish from, from Indie Game the Movie. So, so he's an independent developer. Uh, what's important to understand is the type of indie developer you are will determine the funding you get. So Phil Fish is kind of what we might call a classic indie developer, sort of a solo person, creative genius, uh, a bit nuts, kind of doing his own thing, making a great game, winning awards, you know, getting a lot of press and attention. 
but, but super disorganized in terms of the business side of things. And in fact, you know, a big part of Indie Game the movie was about all these sort of business and legal challenges and problems he had you know, while trying to be creative. Um, so generally speaking, the types of funding that he would have access to would be more project-oriented funding models, right? Someone saying, I love Fez, you know, here's some money to get it, you know, get it done. Phil Fish would not be eligible for more uh, company or studio-based funding models, in part because it's only him. And investors, professional investors, will generally only invest in teams and or actual companies. So if Phil Fish alone with his idea knocked on the door of a venture capitalist, he, he wouldn't really get anywhere. They'd say, go back, get a team, get some co-founders, build a company, you know, help me understand the next three games that you're going to do and the vision and all, and, and, you know, and it wouldn't really work for him. Whereas, you know, he, he did get project-based financing. And so this is sort of the, the, the first big thing to understand when you're thinking of funding is it project funding or is it company funding? And the types of options, the types of sources, when you go get it, how you go get it, changes dramatically whether it is project financing or, or company or studio-based financing. And, and so here's uh, sort of two of the elements to think about. In most cases, project-based financing, it is a deal you're making on revenue share. You're, you're taking someone's money because in the future they want a share of your revenue on the project that they're funding. Whereas for company financing options, it's, uh, the, the stake is supposed to be at the end of equity. It got scrunched, I guess. So it's revenue share versus equity stake. So in company-based financing options, generally what they're doing is they're giving you money to take a piece of ownership of your company. It doesn't have to be all of your company. I mean, this is in part what you're, you're selling. Usually it's, I don't know, 10, 15, whatever percent. So you're not, you're not unloading the whole company, but uh, you're going to... Oh, yes, go ahead. Let's see. Kike was pretty uh, useless, so now let's see what, <laughs> what you can do. Give it, a, give it a shot. Where's Enrique? I love you. Awesome. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyways, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, so, it's, uh, so it's for project, you're, you're essentially giving up revenue share for company funding you're giving up equity in your in your company and then the other piece to um, uh, to think about is control what, what are you giving up also in terms of control so in the project financing options the control you're giving up or potentially giving up is over the IP itself so for example if you do a, a project financing deal with a publisher oftentimes they'll say well I like that IP I'm gonna I'm gonna own it now or I'm gonna control it or I'm going to have first rights on what you do with that in the future, you know, because I'm funding that, that project. So it's, so it's control and ownership around the IP. Whereas in the company option, well, it's, 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 the, it's the board. It's control of the company. So if they're investing in the company, are they taking a seat on your board of directors? Um, all right. Uh, are they taking a seat on your board of directors? You know, how many votes do they have in terms of, you know, what percentage of the company did they buy? So, I mean, oftentimes I hear people say, well, I don't like to talk to venture capitalists or, or formal investors because I don't want to lose control of my company. I mean, that's negotiable. You, just because you take a VC's money doesn't mean automatically you lose control of the company. Uh, I mean, this is what you negotiate in terms of how much of the company they own and also do they, do they or do they not take a board seat. And even if they have one board seat, that doesn't mean they control the... All right, you're, you're like killing everything here. All right, and the, the, the most important slide is coming up. All right. Um, anyway, so, so these are the, the major things you need to think about, whether or not you're going for project-based financing or, um, or, or company-based uh, financing. So in terms of project financing options, generally speaking, these are the ones that developers have some familiarity with. Um, oh, you made it worse, not better. Okay, okay, Do you get, does anyone else want to take a shot? All right, just, just, just leave it here and we'll... Uh... Ah, whatever, it's fine, it's fine. Don't worry about it. We'll survive. Where's Aguardiente when you need it? All right. Okay, so, so uh, in terms of uh, project funding options, uh, these, are, these are some of the things... Um, 
And actually, they're cut off. Let's, uh, should I? No, okay, I broke it again. Shit. It's just they were being cut off. Okay, where's that guy? But <laughs> I, what the hell? I don't see that on my screen. Anyways, all right, what a mess. No, seriously, come back and fix it. Um, so, hey, hey. No, no, I'm serious. Come back and, yo. I, I won't touch it again. I'm sorry. Just. No, because here it's. Somehow it feels. Sorry about this, folks. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, wait, wait, back, back, back. Go back? Yeah, okay, so here. So there's a few that are cut off. We won't worry about those. Um, so, so oftentimes, indies will, will uh, bootstrap via uh, funding through their day jobs. So some indie developers, you know, they've got a day job, whether it's at an actual game company or, you know, I don't know, doing something else, working at a bank. And in the evenings, on weekends, they're, they're, uh, they're sort of self-funding via their, uh, their day job and or, uh, you know, personal, personal savings. I mean, credit cards, uh, you know, some developers will max out their credit cards. I don't recommend this as a, as a good uh, funding option. Uh, friends and family, so there was a guy before that put up his hand when I said, you know, get funding from your mom. So sometimes going to your friends or, or families for funding is certainly an, an option. Um, patronage is one we don't often see. This is sort of the renaissance model where someone very rich likes what you're doing or the project you're working on, they just kind of give, uh, give you money to, to cover your expenses and so on. Uh, festivals and contests, we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, the IGF, the Independent Game Festival, uh, the one at GDC the, being the most popular one, where if you, if you win the IGF, you get like a check for $50,000. Uh, Unreal or, or Epic runs the Make Something Unreal contest, and I think the, the prize of that is over $100,000. Uh, Activision ran some indie contests that, I mean, it was a fairly sizable uh, prize. So there are those options. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's not a, a, a sort of a viable business model to say I'm going to make my money by winning festivals. I mean, because you're not in control of that. There's juries and judges and competitors and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, the, the, the money's out there. One of the more popular ones these days is crowdfunding. You know, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Um, it's tough if your name is not Tim Schafer or if you don't have a very sort of a popular uh, or known brand or IP behind you. Um, so you know, if you're an indie, unknown developer, and it's your first game, you really have to sort of set your expectations low in terms of how much funding you can get through Kickstarter. It's not impossible, uh, and it's going to be a lot of hard work. Uh, but it's certainly, uh, you know, one viable platform if your expectations are set uh, correctly. Uh, alpha sales, that's more so the, the Minecraft model where the game is started but not quite done and they, you're sort of doing pre-sales on the, on the finished version. So Minecraft made a, uh, a bunch of money. But, I mean, you have to have enough of your own resources to get to the point where you, can, where you have an alpha uh, to sell. Uh, publishers are still probably the, the largest source of project-based funding uh, in the industry. Um, you know, traditionally, that's the only source of funding that was out there, but they, and they still do provide uh, a great deal amount of the, the project-based funding that's, uh, uh, that's out there. Uh, and then I forget what the other bullets were, but um, one that's not, r not really viable is, is banks, right? As an independent developer, just starting off without sort of cash flow and revenue, you know, no bank is going to give you a loan or give you money to make, you know, your, your dream idea. Um, so generally speaking, chasing banks for money at, at an indie stage for your project is not, not really uh, viable. Um, and, I mean, each, you know, each one of these, you know, we can do a whole workshop on crowdfunding or a whole workshop on, you know, how to get publisher deals and so on. But, uh, but again, the point here is that the vast majority of these are, are in relation to the project uh, and, and, and you're giving up uh, revenue share. I mean, in most cases. Uh, all right. So, oh, no, one of my slides is totally gone. No, hold on. Oh. Okay. So, uh, in terms of uh, uh, company-based financing, the most important thing to do is think about what stage you're at as a company. And where you are as a company really determines who you go get funding from, you know, how that funding is structured, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the way I like to think of that, that is uh, uh, your st how profitable you are, what stage of profits you're at. So here we have the horizontal axis, which is time, and the vertical is, is profits. Um, and let's see if this works. 
And so, I mean, this is sort of imaginary. Think of this as your company. When you get started at time zero, you know, you have negative profits because you're spending all your money. At the dip, you sort of release your first game. Now you start making revenue. And then when you cross the, the straight line, now you're actually making profit and kind of off you go. Now you're, you're making uh, tons of money. Um, and so uh, different kind of investors are, are viable or approachable at different stages. So the very beginning where you're kind of starting out at zero and, and you're burning your money, that, that's where you go to the three Fs. So the three Fs are friends, family, or fools. Um, or what someone else mentioned before is the, the love money, love capital. Because only someone who loves you will be crazy enough to give you money <laughs> at, that, at that stage. And generally, I mean, this is just rule of thumb. You're looking at sort of $10,000, you know, $50,000. Depends how rich your uncle is uh, or how drunk the guy was at the bar. <laughs> um, but these are small amounts of money to kind of just get you started uh, to start working on your, on your uh, you know, on your stuff. Um, you know, once you get past that point, then you're looking at uh, angels. So angels are uh, high net worth or very rich individuals uh, that generally were entrepreneurs that you know, sold their company to Google or Zynga and they just have loads of money and just to keep busy, they, they like to invest in new companies and entrepreneurs and stuff. Uh, the problem with angels is they're very hard to find. Right? There's no, you can't sort of knock, knock on a door and the, all the angels are there for you to go talk to. Um, so so it's, it's very difficult to reach them, uh, but they're, they're a good source of, of funding if you can kind of network and have the right connections, et cetera. Uh, and they're generally investing in the 50,000 to 250,000 range, just again, sort of, sort of ballpark. Um, and then, you know, once you sort of get past that, then you have the seed uh, level VC. So this is an early stage VC now where a VC is an actual professional investor, uh, they have a formal fund that they invest from. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, this is what they do. This is their job. Their job is to invest in companies and make money off of those, uh, off of those investments. Uh, and they normally, the seed investors normally see you to profitability. At least that's the, that's the hope. Once you get past that point and you're actually making money and making profits, then you can go see the traditional sort of VCs. They invest in sort of the million to five million range uh, but they're investing based on your actual success. So they're, they're there to kind of propel your success. They're there to um, you know, allow you to scale the success. Um, but it, but, it's, a, but it's, a very, it's very different from the first three categories that are really sort of taking a big risk because you haven't yet shown profitability or, or that success. Um, so once you have succeeded, then you can go see the VCs. Uh, and then after that, you have sort of the growth, growth stage VCs with the institutionals. Um, you know, that, that they're investing sort of five to 50 million plus. Um, an example of that would be uh, Supercell in Finland, the guys that do uh, um, Clash of Clans and Heyday. I mean, they, they were, um, I don't know, valued at almost a billion dollars and they did a, an investment round of $130 million uh, based on, you know, huge profits. So that's, that's you know, growth stage uh, investment. So the key here is that you have to recognize what stage you're at to go determ to determine who you go ask for money from, right? So if you're already making profits, you don't go back to your mom and say, hey, mom, can I have $10,000? You know, because you're way, way past that, that stage. Likewise, if you're just getting started off, you're at time zero, you don't go talk to the growth VCs and say, hey, I'd like $50 million for my awesome idea. Like, it's just a complete mismatch. So you have to be cognizant of where you are at what stage and then who, who you approach uh, because the different investors really don't invest at, at different, different stages. Uh, because, again, the, how they invest and the, and the terms of investment and stuff are, are, uh, are quite different. Generally, what you want to try to do is use the investment of one of the earlier stages to prove yourself to the investor at the next stage. Right? So you take the money from your uncle and your mom and your own pocket at the very beginning to build a prototype and build a team so that then you can go to the angel investors and say, look, I borrowed $20,000 from my friends and family. This is where we got, you know, now, like, look, we, we prove that we can actually work together. We can build cool stuff. You know, now we need, you know, $200,000 to really, you know, get somewhere. And then you use the angel money to continue your work. And then that sort of validates for the next stage up, which is the seed, seed investor. And so this is kind of what I refer to as incremental investment. They're using one stage to prove yourself to the next stage, and you're sort of doing it in increments. Because 
generally speaking, there's no one that's just going to give you a giant whack of money for your idea at time zero, right? No one's, if you just show up and say, I've got this vision and here's my awesome team and we're going to do great things, just give me $10 million and don't worry about it, <laughs> you know, all will be good. Uh, like, like, it, uh, like, it just doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Um, Anyway, so you're, you're generally sort of thinking about this kind of incremental type of investment using one chunk of money to validate or prove, to your, prove yourself to the next stage uh, of investor. Um, one of the biggest problems or, or kind of gaps is the, what, what's often referred to as the, the gas tank uh, gap, uh, which is each investor wants to sort of have a sense that the money they're giving you will actually get you to the next stage. Right? No one wants to give you money that's only going to fill your gas tank halfway and you're not going to cross the finish line. Right? So if you, actually, what's interesting is you, you think of uh, a Kickstarter. Right? Kickstarter, you only get the money if you reach the total amount. Right? If you say you want a, a million dollars on Kickstarter, if you only reach 700000 you don't get the 700000 You have to pass the million dollar mark because if you're telling people, oh no, I need $1 million to do this, well, then why would we give you 700? Because then you're not going to get it done. Um, so this is sort of one of the major gaps. Uh, and that gap usually occurs between the seed VC and the traditional VC. Right? That, that, like the, sort of the profitability hump. Right? You take money in from your family, from angels, from seed VCs, because you assume that's going to get you to the finish line, which in this case is profitability. And then you don't quite get there, either because uh, you, know, you mismanage your schedule or uh, you know, your game is, is not sort of taking it, uh, it's not selling enough, and so you need more time and more marketing dollars, et cetera. Um, so that's usually where the biggest kind of gap uh, occurs, and so you need to be thinking about that. And when you do raise money, you know, raise enough money to fill the gas tank to get you to the next, uh, the next uh, finish line. Um, in terms of a few other uh, sort of just tips and, and suggestions, uh, this is my little sort of uh, little image to represent sort of networking and being connected. Uh, it's super important as an indie developer, I mean just in general, not, I mean not only in terms of funding, to really be out there, to really be connected to the community, um, you know, because one, you want feedback, right? You want to share what you're working on, you want to get input and feedback from your peers or, or others in the community. Oftentimes, People may have connections, at, at, at whether it's investors or publishers or, you know, or press, wherever, that they're willing to, to make introductions to. And you can't, you can't do any of that, get any of that, if you're sort of stuck in the basement all the time making your game. So part of being an independent developer is not just being creative and working on cool stuff, but it's also about being entrepreneurial. And being entrepreneurial means you need to think about the business side. You need to get out there. You need to make connections. You need to network. Uh, and, I mean, it happens all the time where you come to an event like this, you tell someone what you're working on, oh, that's cool, you need to talk to my friend here, and then that connection leads you, you know, somewhere else, and sort of it all sort of uh, propagates uh, from there. Um, oftentimes I get asked, well, what, what about, you know, my idea? It's so special, someone's going to steal my idea, uh, so I don't want to talk about it. And what I say is, listen, nobody gives a crap about your idea because everybody has their own idea that they're trying to, you know, get funding or, or, or get input on. Uh, and generally speaking, the big companies only steal ideas once they've proven to be successful. So Zynga is not going to come steal your you know, idea that you're just starting to work on. They're going to go and copy someone who's already made millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, go, go make success first and then worry about Zynga stealing ideas. So, so the value of getting input, the value of making connections, the value of letting people know what you're working on, you know, far outweighs whatever minuscule risk exists that someone can actually steal your idea. So don't, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Um, so be connected. Uh, the other one is in terms of uh, pitching. Uh, you know, a big part of getting investment is being able to pitch. And so actually yesterday, the IGDA Columbia uh, or IGDA Columbia hosted kind of a, a, a pitch sort of test session where several developers, you know, did a little pitch and a few of us from the industry, you know, gave feedback on how to better structure the pitch, et cetera. Uh, and I thought that was great. So, so good job for the, for the IGDA. As a developer, as an independent, as an entrepreneur, you need to be able to sell, your stuff, uh, sell yourself all the time. And I don't mean in a kind of creepy sort of car salesman way, but more in a visionary way, right? That you're working on something great. You're trying to build a company, build a team. 
you have a vision for what you want to do. Pitching really just means selling that vision, hel helping other people believe in what you're doing uh, and sort of want to be part of that story. And if you can't do that, you're going to have tons of problems. You're going to have real trouble, not just in terms of getting investors, but getting other people to join your team. Or when you talk to the press, if you can't sort of pitch your vision or pitch what it is you're doing, the press is not going to sort of believe in what you're working on. So, so, so pitching is actually a super, super important skill uh, you know, at all levels for, for independent developers. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, to do um, some research and learn about pitching. There's a ton, tons of materials on the internet. It's usually not game pitching, but just sort of pitching in general. But um, I, I mean, j just as sort of quick, quick advice, I mean, oftentimes from an investment point of view, uh, they're more interested in, in who you are as an entrepreneur, who you are as a developer, and who your team team is. As I mentioned before, they will rarely invest in a, in a solo uh, developer. They normally want to invest in a team. Uh, and so team dynamics, team cohesion, leadership skills, all that kind of stuff count for a lot when you're talking to investors. Because generally speaking, they're betting on you as a team, as opposed to whether it's ninjas or pirates or dinosaurs. You know, investors don't really have the skill to tell which one's going to be actually more popular uh, in the marketplace. So they're really betting on, on the team. Um, so, so when you're pitching, you should talk about the company, the team, who you are, your background, et cetera. Uh, another big piece of what they're looking at is what's, is what's called traction. So there's two, two forms of traction. One is what I, what I sort of call internal traction and then external traction. So internal traction is the actual real progress you're making on the project. You know, do you have a prototype? You know, have you written your, uh, I don't know, your design Bible? I mean, like all these things that you've actually built uh, and, and produced uh, um, and progress on the actual uh, project and sort of your tech platform or, you know, whatever. Like you've built stuff and done stuff. That's the sort of internal traction to demonstrate that you can work as a team and you know, here's the progress you've made. The other one is the external traction which is stuff like, you know, how many articles have been written about you as a company or you as an entrepreneur or, or your project? You know, did you win a festival? Uh, were you selected to be part of, a, of an incubator? Uh, did you go on a mission with the government to GDC and had, you know, X many meetings? You know, how many Facebook followers or Twitter followers do you have? Is it zero or is it, you know, 20,000? Um, you know, all these kind of things are a form of validation that, that encourages the investor that, that you're something legit, that it's okay, well, these guys are up to something. If they got 20,000, you know, whatever the number is of Facebook followers and, and Twitter followers, okay, someone must really think these guys are, are good or they, wanna, they won the IGF or they were nominated for the IGF. Okay, this is something serious. So the more forms of external validation you can produce or provide, <clears throat> the more um, or the easier it becomes for the investor to say, yes, you know, I'll invest in these, 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 this team. Uh, so validation and being able to talk about that is super important. And so I think actually yesterday, one of the, one of the pitches, uh, the, one of the companies sort of talked about, you know, they were in this, this, they won this prize and they got this funding, they were part of an incubator. And so that kind of automatically encourages or, or makes it easier for the investor to, uh, to invest. Um, anyway, so there's, there's a lot more to pitching, but uh, you know, generally speaking, those are two things that, that developers often forget about. They too readily dive right into the gameplay, the mechanics. Okay, we've got 13 levels, and on this level we have the flamethrower, and the flamethrower has a time, you know, okay, but like investors, like, pff, like they, they, really, they really don't care. Um, so pitching is important. Uh, the next one is um, the l lawyers. So this is the... I don't know why, but whenever, are there any lawyers here? No? Okay, so we're safe. Um, whenever I think of lawyers, I think of uh, the G-Man from, uh, from Half-Life. Um, but actually, lawyers are super, super important, super, super critical. Uh, you know, when you're making or taking investment, even if it's from your mom, uh, you know, having a lawyer or, or being able to refer to a lawyer and, and, and sort of understand the contracts you're signing, I mean, it's kind of true of, of any form of legal stuff, not just investment, like if you're, you know, dealing with publishers or whatever. Super, super critical that you actually engage a lawyer. It costs you money, but they're potentially going to save you massive headaches and, and way more money uh, down the road. Um, and, and it needs to be a lawyer that's familiar with what you're doing. I mean, maybe not necessarily a game-savvy lawyer, but at least someone that's done finance work, transactional-type work. You know, because uh, 
you know, your, your friend's divorce lawyer is a lawyer, but is not really going to be super helpful in terms of, uh, you know, dealing with finance transactions and, and so on. Um, so don't, don't be afraid of the lawyers. Get them involved. Oftentimes, in fact, um, lawyers that are familiar with startup, the startup community and early stage financing will actually uh, take their pay only once you've closed funding. So you can go to a lawyer and say, listen, you know, we're talking to investors. Potentially, we're going to get X, you know, thousands of dollars. We, you know, we're a startup, so we don't have money now. And they'll sometimes say, don't worry, you know, I'll get paid once the deal is closed, and I'll give you advice. And so you know, they're taking a bit of a risk on you, but oftentimes they realize that as a startup, you don't necessarily have the funds to pay for them. So, so you know, don't, don't be afraid of lawyers. Engage them in the process. Uh, you know, they're really uh, necessary. In terms of some um, books, to the extent people still read books these days, uh, two really good books on, on finance would be, well, now you can see all three of them, but uh, um, uh, Venture Deals, great book that sort of dissects uh, the, the control and economic terms around uh, VC finance. So if you're actually going to go out and get angel investment or, or VC money, uh, that would be a great book to read. Uh, you still need a lawyer, but at least now you'll know what the lawyer is talking about. Uh, and then the other one is uh, The Art of the Start. Art of the Start is a more general book about entrepreneurship, pitching. There's a lot of stuff in there about pitching, how to sell your vision, uh, how to approach investors, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of books out there and a lot of websites and resources on pitching and fundraising, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but these are the two, like if you were going to just read two of them, these are the two that I would, uh, I would recommend you, you start with. Uh, and then as kind of a bonus recommendation, The Lean Startup. Uh, who's read The Lean Startup? A couple of people. So everyone in this room should absolutely, uh, you, you were talking about it before, Oscar. Um, so, the, so the stuff that Oscar was talking about before, about the MVP, minimum viable product, all of those concepts were really coming from The, the Lean Startup. Um, and it's more that, it's actually not a book about fundraising, uh, but the concepts and theories apply to how you, get, how you prepare yourself to even be investable. Uh, and to, to run lean, to do stuff like MVP, to you know, test hypotheses, worry about validation and metrics, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so to the extent that you sort of uh, adopt lean methodologies or lean startup approach actually will make you more investable and just in general you'll run your company in a more um, sort of efi efficient uh, manner. Um, yeah, so, anyway, so those are just some of the, the book, uh, book recommendations. And uh, so that's, I mean, I guess, you know, it, it's a massive topic. There's a ton of stuff to dig into. You know, every one of those slides could have been another hour-long sort of workshop or presentation. But really, this was just to kind of give a, an overview on, on funding. And, uh, and I think really the most important piece is if you're going down the path of funding, really think about whether it's you're trying to get funding for this awesome project that you just have to get done. So it's the project options versus if you have a vision for building a studio that's going to make certain types of games and have a certain culture that's really about building this company then going down the, the company path. And so, so just sort of think about that. You know, it's not just, as I said before, there's not just a magic space you go and get the money. You really have to be deliberate and intentional about how you approach uh, your fundraising. So ho hopefully that helps. Thank you very much. We have time for uh, a couple of questions. Yes. All right, so we have time for a couple of questions. I don't have a headset, so uh, if it's in Spanish, I think we need to. Uh, oh, you'll you'll translate. Yeah, I can translate. Okay, go go ahead. All right. Thanks. My name is Victor, by the way. Hey, Victor. How's it going? Nice to meet you. Yes, I'm here. Yes, we'll talk later. All right. So, hi, everybody. Um, got two questions. First one, uh, I'll, I'll make this one first. Uh, when you're making your pitch, uh, a common question is from the VCs or whoever's on the other side is, um, so what are your sales estimates? And, and uh, in a game, especially if it's your first game and you have like, no experience, um, it's completely undetermined. Yeah, there are so many indies out there. And so how do you tell them that? So if a, if a VC is asking about sales estimate on a game, then they're probably not a good VC to be working with. Um, so so um, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you're, if you're talking about sales estimates on a first game, you're, you're literally just pulling those numbers from your ass to make them, to put numbers on a slide. Um, 
good VCs that understand the game space understand that it's hit driven, and so oftentimes they more so want you to present what the business model is. Like this is how we're approaching. Uh, you know, is it free to play? Is it in-app purchases? Is it you know, pay to download? So talking about the business model, and I mean to a certain extent, they want to hear much more about the demographics or like the audience. So, oh, we're going for, you know, teenage girls or, you know, and, and if you can sort of size that demographic, then that's more, more relevant. So if you can say, well, you know, we've done our research and we see that there are, you know, uh, X many millions of soccer, or soccer moms and, uh, you know, this many of them have tablets and so we're going for the, the mom that has a tablet and there's, you know, 200 million of them I'm making these numbers up. Uh, so that's like the addressable market. And then we're using this kind of business model, and this is how we're going to acquire users. I, I, I mean, that's way more uh, intelligent than saying, oh, yeah, on my spreadsheet, I put $1 million because that's what you know, looked good. So I, I wouldn't stress too much about estimates. Uh, and if you do hit a VC that says, well, I want to know what your sales, then, I, like, then you, there's actually a job on your part to educate them. Say, well, game in the streets, hit driven, these are the models that work. You know, we're going for this kind of addressable market, uh, that kind of stuff. So. Um, I, I've never done a pitch where there's been sales estimates, and, and, and most good VCs will say, I don't care about because I know it's just make-believe. So. All right, so the other one is um, about the capital structure. Uh, when you show this, uh, this uh, graph, and um, you know, at the beginning you get some funding, like I did from family yeah. and my mom. She owns the company, actually. Wow. Like, so ni 99%. Your, your, <laughs> yeah. your mom owns the whole company. Yeah, over lunch. <laughs> anyway, so um, so we, we spread you know we, we make uh, we spread the the shares and stuff at home, and then another guy comes in like maybe an angel investor, and then you know capital begins to to spread amongst different different uh, people. Yeah. Uh, let's say we are already in the uh, like supercell. So by the by the end, uh, we're gonna have a, a structure in which how much control do I have and how much shares do I have? And do, is there like a benchmark uh, structure throughout the throughout time that you have seen yeah yeah so so uh, what Victor is referring to is often called as the the cap table or capitalization table which is kind of a spreadsheet that defines how many shares each uh, each investor has which then also determines how much control and how many votes they have etc uh, and when when you say you know you sell 20 percent of your company you know this is sort of what we're talking about in terms of the capital structure. Um, so I mean, there, I mean, you do have to be super careful about that because if you sell too much of your company at the beginning, then there's nothing left to sell or, or you're, you're not left with, uh, with much. So your mom is a super hard negotiator. Um, but um, uh, I mean, interestingly enough, investors, savvy investors are not greedy in terms of taking too much ownership because they want to make sure that the founders are, are motivated. So if they take 99% and they leave you with 1%, well, then how motivated are you to, to put in all your sweat and tears and blood to build a company that really you own not much of? Um, so there are some benchmarks. Again, I would refer to the, you know, do a Google search on, on cap table or capitalization uh, table advice. Uh, generally, by the time you kind of pass the seed round, hopefully you've only sold about a third of your company. So once you, I mean, the angel or, or you know, friends and family generally, it's like you know, a percent or two. Um, you know, angel, yeah. Well, not, your mom is killer. Um, you know, angels are taking you know, an, I mean, whatever, sort of ten percent. I mean, the five percent really depends how much they put in. By the time you're taking seed level money, you should still own, or, or the co-founding team should still own roughly two thirds of the company. Um, again, that doesn't always happen that way. That's just sort of a, a rule of thumb. Uh, but, but if you're interested in cap table stuff, it's probably, you know, th there's a chapter on that in, in, in the book, Venture Deals, uh, and, and there's a lot more info on, on the web. But it is something you need to be very, very careful uh, about, absolutely. Okay. All right. You have a question? Yeah. Right. Uh, well, um, actually, um, it's, it's more based on something of a friend of mine used to say a lot, and, and I, I kind of I kinda wanted to see your take on that. And he told me, well, uh, Jorge, when you're starting, um, usually break even is a win so don't when you're starting don't expect to have like this huge sales and all this stuff but breaking even on your first project means that you guys could do something that, that could work and and I, I don't know if it's if it, it if it's still viewed that way but but i believe that that's very important because a lot of people you're going to have very hard time starting your own company and games yeah, yeah. So, so 
That, that's actually a really good, uh, a really good point. And certainly, sort of, if you're talking about mobile and social kind of free-to-play games, if that's your first time you're doing that kind of game, the chances you're going to succeed are, are very slim. And so, you know, you're lucky if you even hit break-even. But the whole point is that that becomes sort of a learning process and also a stepping stone to then build your second game. Um, so, for example, at Execution Labs, when we're investing in teams, we're, we're I mean, obviously we want the teams to do as best as they can on the first game, but we're thinking about how do we support them on the second game. Uh, and smart investors are actually thinking about your second and third game. So part of that gap I was talking about, the gas tank gap, is don't necessarily think, how do I finish the first game because, oh my God, it's going to make me rich and famous, but how do I build my company such that I can actually build three games and sort of plan your funding uh, al along that way. And that sort of becomes part of the vision uh, you know, of what you do and, and, and how you build your company. Um, and the other piece of that is each game should be um, sort of a, um, well, not a stepping stone, but provide something that's useful to the next game. So for example, this first game you build, you know, maybe you build some, um, you know, uh, a back-end technology to connect users and you have some matchmaking stuff and, you know, it's about ninjas or whatever, but uh, ninjas aren't popular this year, so your ninja game, you know, doesn't do sales, and then you're going to work on a pirate game, but at least now you take all of that infrastructure, the back-end tech, the user account management, and you're not starting from scratch on the pirate game. You're starting from a point where at least sort of the investment you made as a company into the first game, a lot of it can be leveraged into the second game. And, and then the second game, maybe you break even or make a few, few dollars, but then you're using what you've invested in that in terms of technology and know-how and, and investment in the team to then sort of build your third game uh, and so on. So it, it's a great point, um, and this is sort of part of the funding gap, is think, I mean, you should be thinking three games ahead. That also means you should go really fast on your first game. Right? This is one of the things I encourage startups is like, you're not going to build Lord of the Rings on your first go. Like, just, just build something small. Like, nobody's paying attention to you. Nobody cares about you. There's so much to learn in terms of how the App Store works, how to do user acquisition, monetization, design. I mean, you're going to learn so much that you're, you're, you're better off going through that process as quickly as possible rather than slowing down and saying, oh, well, we don't want to you know, risk everything. It's like, no, like, screw it up on the first one so you learn and then, and then you can sort of do better on the, on the second and, and third. Um, all right, so I think, I think that's, uh, we're out of time. Uh, all right, well, apologies for the, the PowerPoint fun and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, and uh, you know, sorry for the initial hiccup. Uh, <laughs> the laptop just arrived, so I, you know, the logistic people brought it. I'm sorry you had to go to go through that initial thing, but it's not going to happen for the rest. That's the good news for the rest of the speakers. It's only Jason, <laughs> but he's like uh, from the house, so yeah. <laughs>